Shalom friends, welcome to another Shi'ur in Talmud. We're studying Masechet Brachot, Tractate Brachot, Blessings, dealing with all of the laws that pertain to a Jew in his life related to reciting blessings on various occasions. I'm Eliyahu Shir from Chesed for Emet, broadcasting from the holy city of Yerushalayim. And you can find my site at www.lovingkindness.co. So we're studying from the Korean Talmud Babli. For those who don't know, unfortunately, Rabbi Adin Steinzaltz, the author of this beautiful edition that we have in front of us, uh, died just two days ago on Erev Shabbos. And so let us, everything that we're learning really over here that we see in front of us and all the previous shiurim and the shiurim to follow are really due to all the effort that he put in into making this publication available to us. So let us do our learning today as an alias neshama for the soul of Adin ben Abraham Moshe. And of course, in any case, all of our learning is really for his merits. Let's remember always as we get involved in this learning that this is what counts in life. It's something to think about as we spend our hour involved in the study of Torah at this point in time. This is what is going to be presented in front of us when we leave this world. And Hashem is going to say, well, what did you do with your time? And we'll be able to say, here we were involved in the study of Torah. And automatically it triggers something and it brings us to a higher level in the world above. Really, we don't even have to say that we're doing this learning in memory and as an alias neshama for Rabbi Adin Steinzaltz, because automatically the fact that we are learning from his work automatically triggers off that it should be a merit towards him. And of course, as we do this learning ourselves, this is the trigger. Likewise, that when we leave this world, it will act as a merit to us. Better that we should spend this time involved in the study of the Holy Torah than that we should spend the time involved in fr frivolities and various things that are so extraneous that we don't really have to put the time in to wasting our time in those particular things. This is what really counts. And uh, on the day of judgment, when we leave this world, these are the words that are going to come up in front of us. And we're going to be able to say that we studied the Torah of Hashem and we learned how to put it into practice. And all the people that assisted us, whether it was teachers, whether it was the books that they wrote, all of these people will have a share in the efforts of teaching this Torah and in learning this Torah and in bringing this Torah, which is kindness and goodness into the world. So here we are on Masechet Brachot, Tractate Brachot, and we're currently on Daf Yud Aleph, Amud Base, that's 11b. And our previous Shi'ur dealt with the idea of the mitzvah of the Kriyat Shema, that we have to recite Brachot before we recite the Kriyat Shema. And afterwards, of course, we recite brachot as well. And what were the brachot that we had to recite before we, recite, before we do the Kriyat Shema? And there was a debate that was discussed. Well, let me open up the, the video and this um, channel for you and say to you, why don't you share with me in the comments what makes you excited by reciting the Kriyat Shema? What do you get out of reciting the brachot of the Kriyat Shema? What does it do to you? This channel is supposed to be devoted to interaction. And I want to hear what excites you about the Torah that we're learning. How does it impress upon you? What difference does it make in your life when you listen to a shiur, when you read these words? And of course, the practicality of it, when you involve yourself in reciting the Kriyat Shema, what do those brachot do for you? How do they help you to meditate on the words of the Kriyat Shema? What difference does it make to you? And then, and then we continued, of course, and we spoke about the blessing that we recite before studying Torah, that every single morning, before we engage in the study of Torah, we must recite a bracha. Now, last week, we were, a question was asked as to how do we implement this idea that it says that if a person did not recite the bracha in the morning for the study of Torah, but he did recite the Kriyat Shema, that the Kriyat Shema acts as the bracha for the Torah study that he will do. And I forgot to actually mention over here that there is on the left-hand side over here under the halakha, there is a halakha that is brought down here, and I'm sorry that I forgot to read it. I'll read it right away, and then immediately we'll continue back from where we left off last week. So it says over here that he need not recite 
that blessing. If he recited the Shema, he need not recite that blessing. Meaning he, he, he need not recite the blessing for the study of Torah because the, because the, the Shema that he says acts as the bracha itself. One who has recited the blessing and abounding love need not recite the blessing on the Torah as he has already fulfilled his obligation. However, because the Jerusalem Talmud restricts the cases where this halakha applies, the halakhic conclusion is that one must learn Torah immediately after reciting the blessing and abounding love in order for it to serve as a blessing on the Torah. So there's a discussion that goes about over here that if we are going to use the blessing that precedes the Kriyat Shema of Avas Oilam or Ava Rabbah in place of the bracha of the studying of Torah, then how do we actually use it in practice? And the answer is that we must make certain that immediately after reciting this blessing, we should engage in the study of Torah, which means as a minimum that the moment we finish davening, we should not turn our minds away from the Torah study that we're about to do because we have said a blessing, which is the blessing before Kriyat Shema, which relates to the study of Torah. And immediately afterwards, we need to immediately start studying Torah. If after davening, immediately afterwards, and immediately afterwards, we forget to study Torah, then of course, we must recite the bracha on the study of Torah. And that's basically where we've got to. The question was asked and presented last week, and I forgot to read that particular halakha. So when we got over here onto page 75 of the Korean Talmud Bavli, we see that Rabbi Amar, Rabbi said, Afle Talmud, Tzarek. even for the study of Talmud, one is required levarech, to make a blessing. We discussed that it could be that under certain circumstances, one might not have to recite the blessing on the Torah. But ultimately, the conclusion is that whatever Torah we're going to study, we need to recite the bracha on the study of Torah. Torah is not a secular pursuit. It is not something that we open up a book and we read the story and kind of like it's just an enjoyable thing. But rather, not only is it enjoyable, but it is a godly thing. And in order to show our connection to the godliness, we need to make the blessing on the Torah every single morning, no matter what Torah we come to study. Let us take a look over here on the side where we can see the halakha mentioned. For Bible, one needs to recite a blessing, lemikra, tzarik levarech. One is obligated to recite the blessing on the Torah before engaging in the study of any form of Torah. E, i.e., Bible, Mishnah, Gemara, or Midrash. This is in accordance with the opinion of Rava, the last of the sages to comment on this issue. His ruling is based on a practical application of the halakha, which overrules a halakha that was merely cited but not implemented. Brought down over here, as you see in the Rambam and in the Shulchan Aruch. The Amarav Chia Bar Ashi, we continue in the Gemara now, back to our story. Rav Chia Bar Ashi said, Zimnim Tzagi'in, Hava Ka'ameina Kamei Derav. It happened many times that I would stand up in front of Rav, Litnuyei Pirkin Besifra Dvei Rav, in order to study our chapters of the Sifra in the house of Rav. Hava Makdim, so he would proceed, the Kamashe Yedei Ubareich. He would go and wash his hands, and he would make the blessing, and then he would teach us the chapter that we're going to learn. Here we see a clear reference that before Rav would begin his teaching, he would go off and wash his hands in cleanliness, in ritual purity. These are important things altogether. When we study Torah, our hands should be clean, our body should be clean. And immediately afterwards, he would recite the bracha on the study of Torah. And then afterwards, he would teach the teachings that the students were coming to study. Asks the Gemara, my Mavarech, what was the blessing that he would make? Omar Rav Yehuda, or let's say, what is the blessing that a person would make? Not necessarily what he made, but what is the blessing that we should make when we are studying Torah, before we study the Torah? Omar Rav Yehuda, Omar Shmuel. Rav Yehuda said that Shmuel said, Asher Kedishan La'asok Bedivrei Torah. He says that the blessing is, blessed, blessed are you, God, King of the universe, etc., etc., that ha he has commanded us in his mitzvahs, and he has commanded us to occupy ourselves in the study of Torah. 
basically that is the blessing that we make god has commanded us to occupy ourselves in the study in the words of the torah over here on the right we see uh, we're not there yet there's an additional note before we get there for rabbi yochanan messiah bahaki and rabbi yochanan concludes the blessing in the following way in other words first make the blessing and immediately after reciting the blessing, recite the following. Make pleasant, please, Hashem, our God, the words of your Torah in our mouth, in our mouths, and in the mouths of your nation, the house of Israel. And may we be ourselves and our descendants and the descendants of your nation, the house of Israel. Everybody should know your name. And occupy and engage in your Torah. Who, has, who teaches the Torah to his nation, Israel. This is the end part after reciting the bracha. We ask for a special blessing in addition to sanctifying the moment, as we sanctify the moment of studying Torah, we ask Hashem as a request, please make the words of Torah sweet in our mouths. Which means to say, many people will study Torah and they find it sometimes a little bit boring, a little bit slow. They feel they're not getting out of it what they really hope to get out of it. They felt it would be more exciting. There's something lacking. So we say to Hashem, before we study Torah, really all the Torah is sweet. But the problem is that sometimes we involve ourselves in a particular sugya, a section of Torah, and it doesn't sound as interesting as we thought it might. And sometimes we feel a bit distracted, a bit tired, and we don't want to involve ourselves in that Torah, at the moment at least. So we say to Hashem, please make it that the words of your Torah will be sweet in our mouths. That means to say, as we study the Torah, we get, we get a geschmack out of it. We get a geschmack. It's tasty. It's something that I want to really involve myself in, and I enjoy this particular taste. Rav Hamnuna Omar, Rav Hamnuna said that one should recite afterwards, People, of course, who get an aliyah to the Torah will recognize these words. Baruch atah Hashem noisein haTorah, that He has chosen us from amongst all the nations, and He has given to us His Torah. Blessed are you, Hashem, the giver of the Torah. This is also a very beautiful bracha. Omar Rav Hamnuna, Rav Hamnuna said, Zohi meulah sheba brachot. This is the most beautiful. This is the most superior of all of the blessings. Hilchach. Therefore, the Gemara concludes. You should say them all. Say that first bracha to occupy oneself in Torah. Say the special blessing that we ask Hashem, the prayer. Please, Hashem, make your Torah sweet in our mouths and in our mouths, the mouths of our children and our descendants and so on and so forth amongst all of the Jewish people. And then we say that you have chosen us. Hashem, you have chosen us amongst all the other nations. All the other nations don't have a Torah to learn from. We have a Torah. What can we learn in the Torah? We learn the history of the world from the time that Adam was born until Moshe took the Jewish people into Israel. We see a focus already on the Jewish people because that, after all, is what the Bible is intrinsically all about, is the story of the Jewish people coming into the land of Israel. And thereafter, we see the prophets came along and how the Jewish people behaved during that period of time. And there were the kings, and there was the building of the temple, and the temple was destroyed, and so on and so forth. We have a beautiful Torah. And the Torah teaches us laws of living. It teaches us about life itself. Anything that we want to know about in life, we can find answers for in the Torah, as long as we search for it, as long as we search it out. And we ask the right people, and we ask the right questions, we'll find the answers that we need to continue our lives and to be inspired. But the nations of the world don't have this. When it comes to them and they want to find out what life is all about, they pick up books on philosophy and they pick up books on the history of the world in general, written by ordinary authors as opposed to God who gave us the Torah with this particular history, which is the accurate history of the world. And so they lack this godliness and they lack the structure in their lives to understand the beauty of what we involve ourselves in 
all day in terms of the laws of the Torah. We can put tefillin on. We can keep Shabbos. We can keep a kosher diet. There are all sorts of things that we involve ourselves in which actually bring us to a level of holiness to cleave to God. And the nations of the world, unfortunately, lack this. They have their own way. The Torah says that there are the seven mitzvahs of B'nai Noach, the seven mitzvahs that pertain to the children of Noach. And of course, every non-Jew is welcome to convert if they wish to. There's no, nobody is forcing them to. But the Torah is open for everybody. But the Torah was given exclusively to the Jewish people in essence. And so therefore we thank Hashem and say, thank you for giving us the Torah. Thank you for making it sweet. My mitzvah is to now occupy myself in the study of your Torah. Tanan Hasam, we learnt over there, Om Alahim Hamamune. Now we come to another story, as he brings down over here in the note, that the Gemara returns to dealing with the blessings that accompany Shema and describes the, the practice of the temple. And what happens in the days of the temple? We learnt over there that the Mamune, the Kohen who was appointed, the deputy high priest who was appointed to, to, um, uh, to, to oversee the activity in the temple, he would say the following to everybody. Baruchu bracha achatz. And this over here is a Mishnah from Masechet Tamid. It's another Mishnah, another section of the Shisha Sidre Mishnah of the Masechtas of the Talmud. In Tamid, we see that the Mishnah says, Baruchu bracha achatz. The Kohen would say, Bless, one blessing, he said to everybody. Vahem berchu, and they blessed it. Vakaru said had brought, and afterwards they would read the Ten Commandments. Shema, then they would say the Shema. Vahaya im Shamua, then they would say Vahaya im Shamua, the second paragraph of the Shema. And it will be if you listen. Vayoimer, and then they would say the third paragraph of the Kriyat Shema. Uberchu is Sa'am Shalosh Brachot, and then they would bless the entire nation, with three blessings. Emes v'yatsiv, that was the one blessing that they would say, which means truth, truthful, truth and true and firm. Va'avoida, then they would make the blessing of the avoida, the service. Or birkas koanim, and then they would make the, the blessing of the blessing of the koanim. Yivarecha Hashem v'yishmerecha, etc., etc. Or b'shabbes mosifin baracha achas, and on Shabbos, they would add an additional bracha, lemishmar hayaitse, to the guarding kohanim who would go out. In the times of the temple, there would be guards of kohanim, which means to say that there would be certain kohanim that would serve at a certain period in time. And then afterwards, those kohanim would leave, and new kohanim would come in and serve in the temple. And it worked on a rotation basis. So when the kohanim would go out from the old rotation, and then the new kohanim would come come in. So then when the, when the Mishmar, when the rotation, the guarding of the Kwanim would go out on Shabbos, they would add an additional blessing for this Mishmar, for this uh, priestly watch as they would leave their duties on Shabbat. Let us just take a look at some of these notes on the side. What was the blessing? Therefore, let us write and recite them all. What was the blessing that they would recite? Uh, what is the blessing that we should recite? on the, for, for learning Torah. Every morning, one must recite the three blessings of the Torah as per the ruling over here. We recite all these brachot. We say the bracha for making, uh, uh, that we should engage in Torah. We say the blessing of making the Torah sweet. And then we say, Hashem Bachabanu. We also recite this bracha that Hashem has chosen us from amongst all the nations of the world. The Sifra of the school of Rav. Sifra Devei Rav. The Sifra. Book of the School of Rav is a work of halachic midrash on the book of Leviticus. It is also known as Torah Kohanim. This midrash consists primarily of Taneyatic statements which derive various halachot from verses. The Talmud states that unattributed statements in the Sifra are in accordance with Rabbi Yehuda's opinion, although apparently the final redaction of the work was completed by Rav. Therefore, it is called the Sifra of the School of Rav. Rav also taught this halachic midrash extensively and its study became standard among the sages to the extent that it became the most quoted work of Halachic Midrash in the Talmud. We continue in the notes, the appointed one, Hamamune, the Kohen who was appointed, as we said before, he is the one who says, everybody, make a blessing. Responsible for tasking the performance of the temple service and for overseeing the other duties of the temple, 
He was the most senior official in the temple. As such, this individual was essentially the assistant to the high priest. Although from a halakhic perspective, he had no privileged status and was no different from any, of the, from any other priest. He was appointed primarily to serve as a substitute for the high priest. Whenever the high priest was unable to execute his duties due to illness or ritual impurity, this individual would replace him. As time went on, the responsibilities associated with the, with the position grew. As the appointed one became responsible for tasking the performance of the temple service, the status of this position grew to be one of the most influential in the temple, second only to the high priest. So this was the Mamune, this was the appointed Kohen, and his duty at this point in time was to tell everybody it's time to re recite a bracha. And then afterwards, they would recite all these other things. They would start, they recite the Kriyat Shema, and they would recite the Ten Commandments, and they would recite all these other things as brought down in the Gemara. What does this mean that they recited the Ten Commandments? The Jerusalem Talmud, in its explanation of this Mishnah, explains that there is a relationship between the Ten Commandments and the recitation of Shema, as allusions to all Ten Commandments can be found in the verses of Shema. Those who wish to, one can see, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Rav Hai Gaon, I think he mentions that he points out that the, he points out exactly which are the statements in the Shema, which relate directly to the Ten Commandments. There's a direct correlation. And let's not be fooled either that the Ten Commandments themselves are in essence the summary and a, an abbreviated form of the entire Torah, the 613 mitzvot. So for example, if one takes the number 613, and we add 6 plus 1 plus 3, we get 10. And this corresponds to the Ten Commandments. Inside the Ten Commandments are hidden all 613 mitzvot. And of course, essentially, in the first two commandments are hidden also, in summary, all 613 mitzvot. Because the first commandment is a positive commandment. I am God who took you out of the land of Egypt. Referring to the fact that we have a mitzvah to serve him positively. And the second commandment that says, you shall have no other gods before me, that refers to the fact of the negative commandments. Because it's negative. You shall not have. Negative. So we see over here that even in the first two commandments, the entire Torah is uh, summarized within those commandments. And this is what the Shema is. So the Shema, in essence, contains within it the Ten Commandments, and it's basically connected the directly correlating the Shema to the Ten Commandments. My brachachat, the Gemara asks the question, what is this blessing? The Kohen would come and he would say to everybody, everybody recite a blessing. But at this point in time, the Gemara doesn't tell us what the blessing is. Of course, everybody's going to recite the Kriyat Shema afterwards. And since they're going to recite the Kriyat Shema afterwards, isn't this a hint to the possibility that the blessing that is recited is actually the blessing that precedes the Kriyat Shema. And we learned that before we recite the Kriyat Shema, we must recite two blessings. What is the one blessing? Ki had Rabbi Abba Rabbi Yesei Bar Abba. This thing happened to Rabbi Abba and Rabbi Yesei, the son of Abba. Iklu lahu atra. It means they happened to come to a particular place. Ba'u minahu. Everybody came and they asked the rabbis, My bracha achat, could you please enlighten us and tell us what was the blessing that the Kohen would ask for everybody to recite? It just said, recite a, a blessing. So fine, what is the blessing? My bracha achat. In this particular town, when the rabbis came, the community approached them and said, Rabbis, can you tell us what was the blessing that was recited? But they didn't know. It wasn't in their hands. Apparently, they didn't know what the blessing was. So they went off and they went to ask a Rav Matana. But he didn't have it in his hands, which means he didn't know the answer. He didn't know what blessing was recited. So they came and they asked to Rav Yehuda. Omar Lehu, Rav Yehuda said to them, Hachi Omar Shmuel. This is what Shmuel said. Ahavaraba. It was Ahavaraba. When the Kohen asked everybody to make the blessing before reciting the Kriyat Shema, what was it that he asked them to bless? Ahavaraba. 
Now, we know that before we recite the Kriyat Shema, there are in fact two blessings that we recite. The first is Yotzer or Uvore Choshek, as we learned in the previous lesson. And the second blessing is Ava Rabba or Ava Solam, depending on what the Nusach is, depending on what the version of the text is. So according to Shmuel, according to Rav Yehuda, he says that Shmuel said that the blessing is Ava Rabba. That is the blessing that they used to make. Omar Rabbi Zerika, Omar Rabbi Ami, Omar Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, and Rabbi Zerika said that Rabbi Ami said that Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, Reish Lakish said, Yotzer Or. The blessing that they would recite was Yotzer Or. Yotzer Or deals with the fact that God is forming the light. Ahava Rabba deals with the love that Hashem has towards the Jewish people, the Jewish people towards Hashem, the study of Torah, love, expression. But the first blessing deals with the actual day. As the light breaks into the day, Yotzer or Uvorei Choshek, he forms the light and he creates darkness. So according to Rabbi Zrika, who said that Rabbi Ami said, who said that Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish said, the bracha was in fact Yotzer or. Not Ava Rabba. Ki Azarabita, the story taking place. The Gemara is telling us a story. We're understanding the halakha ultimately from the story that took place amongst these various rabbis. Ki Azarabita, Bar Yosef Amar, when Rav Yitzhak, the son of Yosef, came, which means to say that he came from Bav, he came from Yisrael Israel, and he came to Babel. Whenever the Gemara says when so and so came, it means that he arrived from Eretz Israel to Babel, the place where the Gemara was ultimately written down. So when he came, Amar, he said, Ha the Rabbi Zrika, this teaching that you heard about here of Rabbi Zrika, who said that Rabbi Ami said, who said that Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish said, love the Perush Itmar. It was not said explicitly, Ella, but rather, Miklala Itmar. It was said as an inference, meaning there are two ways of understanding something. Either we know the tradition, and that's what it is, but if we don't know the tradition, we might be able to infer what the halakha can be through logic. If we can think about something logically, then we can also understand what it should be, even if we don't know explicitly what it should be. But logically, we can work out what it should be. So according to Rabbi Yitzhak, the son of Rabbi Yosef, he says that this teaching of Rabbi Zrika was not said explicitly that actually this is correct, it was Yotzer Or, but rather he inferred it, he deduced it out. The Omar Rabbi Zrika, that Rabbi Zrika said, Omar Rabbi Ami, that Rabbi Ami said, Omar Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, that Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish said, Zoto Meret, this means, Brachot, that the brokers do not hold back one from the other. What does it mean exactly that the brokers do not hold back one from the other? One bracha does not prevent the opportunity of the other bracha from being said. And that's what he wants to come to teach us. That if a person, for example, only recited one blessing and he didn't recite the other blessing, he still fulfilled his obligation. For example, if one is doing a combination, like a combination lock, and one has three numbers that one has to get in order to open up the lock. If one doesn't get all three numbers correct, the lock will not open. But sometimes it can be that the lock only requires two numbers to be correct. And the other number is irrelevant for the purpose of the lock. Or it could even be that one lock is sufficient. One number is sufficient on the lock and it unlocks it. And the other two numbers are not really necessary. Here he's coming to teach us that if a person only recited one blessing, it is sufficient and it doesn't hold back the mitzvah of the Kriyat Shema from fulfilling the obligation of the Kriyat Shema. Just because a person only recited one blessing does not mean that he has lost out on the mitzvah of Kriyat Shema and he may recite the blessing of the other blessing at another stage. It is irrelevant at what point in time the point is, you don't need both blessings in order to recite the Kriyat Shema and to fulfill the obligation.
Here we just read in the notes, this means that if only one of the blessings was recited, the obligation to recite that blessing was fulfilled as the two blessings are not mutually dependent. E amarat bishlama, if you want to say all is well and good, yotzer or havu omri, that actually the blessing that they recited was yotzer or in accordance with what Rabbi Zerika said over here and Rabbi Ami said that Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish said, hainu, if you say that this is the case, yotzer or havu omri, that's what they said, hainu de brachos ein akvos zo etzo. We can see that the blessings do not hold each other back. One blessing does not prevent the other blessing from being recited. The law ka amri ahavaraba, because they did not recite ahavaraba. What is this, what's going on here? Let's take a look over here in the notes. The conclusion was drawn for Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish's statement that he held that the single blessing recited was who creates light. The considerations that led the sages to that conclusion were Granted, if you say that they would recite who creates light, then the conclusion of Reish Lakish, that failure to recite one of the blessings recited before Shema does not prevent one from reciting the other, is understandable. As they recited who creates light and did not recite an abounding love, and they nonetheless fulfilled their obligation. We move on to Daf Yud Base, Amud Aleph. This is page 12, side A. Ella, however, E amrat, if you want to say, that would work out nicely. But if you want to say, Ahava Rabba, Havu Omri, that they would actually recite the Ahava Rabba prayer, my brachos ein akvos zo etzo. What does it mean? How do we understand it? That one brocha will not prevent the other brocha. Dilma, perhaps, Haidelo Amri Yoitzer, or you couldn't use this as a logical argument. Because perhaps it was that the reason that they didn't recite Yotzer Or had nothing to do with the concept of one brocha preventing another brocha, but rather, Mishum de lo metazman, because the time had not yet come for Yotzer Or, for the fact that God forms the light. Meaning what? It means to say that the Kohen were appointed to tell everybody to recite the bracha was doing so before the sun had risen. And since he was doing this before the sun had risen, and he said, recite a bracha, they could not recite Yotzer or yet, because the sun had not yet risen. So therefore, what was the bracha that should be recited? Ahavaraba, and not Yotzer or. But if we want to learn out the concept that one bracha does not hold back another bracha, we would never be able to learn the concept from this particular episode. Because the reason that the Ahavaraba was recited was not to teach us that one bracha can prevent another broka, or it doesn't prevent the other broka, but rather it's that they had to do it because the sun had not yet risen. The key metaz man yotzer or, and when the time came for them to do the yotzer or, which means the sun had risen, have omri, they would say it. And therefore we can't learn out in our previous teaching, as we said, that the brokers uh, do not prevent one from the other. Because under these circumstances, a person might say, well, if he said, if he said, Ahava Rabba, maybe he can't recite Yotzer Or. But if he said Yotzer Or, he for sure can recite Ahava Rabba. Because Yotzer Or, and he said it especially at the time when it was still early, for sure he could have said Ahava Rabba. But he didn't say it. So therefore, for sure, one blessing does not prevent another. The Imiklala, and if we learn it based on an inference, my. What, is, what does it mean? What of it? Who cares if we learn it from the inference as opposed to learning it directly? The imiklala, because if it is from an inference, le olam, we would always have to learn ahava rabba havu omri, that they said ahava rabba. The himetaz man yotzer or, and when the time came for reciting, for the time that you could recite yotzer or, Havu Omri lay, then they would say it. Umai brochas ein makvot zo et zo. And what does it mean, therefore, that the brochas do not prevent one from the other? It doesn't mean to say that the brochas uh, prevent that if you only say one, you fulfill your obligation, but rather the argument comes to teach us, say de brachot, the order of the blessings, which means to say, if I say yotzer or first, or I say ava rabba first, 
It makes no difference. I still fulfill my obligation no matter what the order is. So even if one recites an abounding love before who creates light, he fulfilled his obligation. Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish did not refer to a case where only one of the blessings was recited. Consequently, one cannot infer from his statement his opinion regarding the identity of the single blessing. He was coming to teach us a concept of the inference behind the idea that the order of the blessings does not hold back and prevent the recitation of the Shema, and you can recite the brokers in any order that you want to. But he did not come to tell us ultimately which was the bracha that they recited. And therefore, we don't know at this point in time what the bracha was, according to the discussion over here, according to Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish. Although, as we said before, the idea that we heard before was ultimately that um, Rabbi Abi, Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Yosi Bar Abba, when they came along, so according to Shmuel, this was according to Rabbi Yehuda, according to Shmuel, the blessing was in fact Av Rabba, and it was there as a statement rather than as an inference. So we continue over here. Let's take a look at the background. The priestly watches. Even before the temple's construction was completed, there were already more priests than necessary to perform the sacred service. Therefore, King David and the prophet Samuel established priestly watches. Based on ancient criteria, the priests were grouped into 24 watches, each serving in the temple for one week twice a year. Only during the pilgrimage festivals, when the entire nation ascended to Jerusalem, did all the priests come to the temple. During the second temple period, the watches were redivided. However, the basic divisions remained intact. Each watch was divided into six paternal families, each assigned to one day of the week, so that all of the members of the watch would serve. The changing of the watches took place each Shabbat, and they would then perform the ceremony and recite the blessing for the incoming priestly watch, as we said above. If based on an inference, what of it? Imiklala mai. This question appears quite often, following the statement, it was derived by inference. It is conceivable that although a statement is not stated explicitly, the conclusion derived from it is inevitable. At times, the second inferred version is clearer than the sage's original statements. Then the Gemara asks, and if it is based on an inference, what of it? The Gemara generally answers that nevertheless, the conclusion is not inevitable. Now we continue. Oh, so here we have a halacha, the order of the blessings, Sayyidi Brachot, an error in the order of the blessings accompanying Shema does not prevent fulfillment of one's obligation to recite the Shema, just as we learned in Agamara. If he recited an abounding love before reciting who creates light, he nevertheless fulfilled his obligation after the fact, Bidiyavad. This is based on the conclusion drawn from the statement of Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish, brought down here in the Rambam, in the Shulchan Aruch, etc. And that's halakha lemaisa. One might say, why would a person recite the brachot in the wrong order? Well, the answer is quite easy. Because in the old days, not everybody had a siddur. Going back hundreds of years ago, before the printing press, not everybody had access to their own personal siddur. And it could be that while they were reciting the blessings, they might have got a bit, uh, a bit uh, confused. And as a result, they said the bracha in the wrong order. And they would need to know if they did recite the bracha in the wrong order, if they had indeed fulfilled the obligation. And yes, bidiyavad, they still fulfilled the obligation. There is no direct order to the brachot that are recited. Now the Gemara continues with the next section. Then after this, that they've said this blessing, and then they said the Shema, and they read the Ten Commandments. Shema, and they say the Shema, sorry, the order is first the Aserit Adibrot, then they say Shema, Vahaya Im Shamua, Vayomer. Now these are the order, this is the order of all the uh, prayers that they're reciting. Emes V'yatsiv, Va'avoda, Ubirkas Kohanim. All these different blessings, all these different prayers, they say it in this particular order. The Gemara continues. Omar Rav Yehuda, Omar Shmuel, Rav Yehuda said that Shmuel said, Av bagvulin, even in the outlying areas, which means outside of the temple, Bikshuli cross came. They requested to recite such. In other words, to recite the Ten Commandments. Ella, however, rather, Shikavan bitlum, Taromes, Haminim. But they had already 
nullified the saying of the Ten Commandments during davening on account of the grievances of the heretics. Which means to say, there were certain people in those days that came to say, if you're saying the, the Ten Commandments in the davening, surely the Ten Commandments are the main part of the Torah. We should all fulfill the Ten Commandments. But they were heretics, which means to say, that's all that they were coming along to say. Isn't it true? We should follow the Ten Commandments. But don't tell me stories about Kashrut. Don't tell me stories about uh, 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 all sorts of other mitzvot that make the Torah so full and with all sorts of ideas. Because what? The Ten Commandments, that is what was important to the rabbis. And they made a mockery of it. As a result of that, the Ten Commandments was taken out of the davening so that people shouldn't think that the essence of Torah is the Ten Commandments. Rather, the essence of Torah is 613 mitzvot. Therefore, of course, if a person wants to recite the Ten Commandments every day, call like a vote. he may recite the Ten Commandments. But he should recite it, of course, privately. He shouldn't recite it as part of the actual davening itself. But in those days, they would recite it as part of the davening until the heretics came along and they said, they started causing problems, making out as if this was what was the most important part of the Torah and the rabbis didn't want it to be that way and so they removed it. Tanya Namihachi, it was taught also in a brighter Rabbi Nassan Omer. Rabbi Nassan says, Bagvulin Bikshuli Kroskain. In the Gavulin, they requested to read. It means to say that this is another brighter. It means this was taught somewhere else. It means in one school they learned it, and in another school they also learned it, which gives credence to the fact that the issue that we're dealing with was known and that there was a, def a definitive ruling on it, and this is how it came out. So it was taught in another brighter. According to Rabbi Nassan, that in the outlying areas from the temple, they requested to do so, to read it, to read the Ten Commandments. But already they had nullified it at that time period on account of the grievance of the, uh, of the heretics. Rabbi Barbarchana Sevar Lemikbeinu Basura. Now, Rabbi, the son of the son of Chana, he held to institute it in Surah, where he was, obviously. Omalei Rav Chista, Rav Chista said to him, Kvapitlum, Mibnei Taromis Aminim. Already they have nullified it, meaning reciting the Ten Commandments, on account of the grievance of the heretics. Interesting that this rabbi was called Rabbi Bar Bar Chana, as if where is his father? Rabba Bar, Rabba the son of the son of Chana. So the tradition that we have is that he was named after his father because his father died um, before he was born. And as a result, he was known as not Rabba Bar Rabba, but he was known as Rabba Bar Bar Chana. He was known as Rabba, the son of the son of Chana. That is how he got his name. Now, Surah. Sura was a town in southern Babylonia. Sura did not become an important Jewish community until the great Amoira Rav moved and established the yeshiva there. In the, you see, in about the year 220, from, the, from then until the end of the Geonic period, approximately the year 1000, Sura was a major terrorist center. The yeshiva in Sura, under the leadership of Rav and his closest disciples, was influenced by the halachic traditions of Eretz Israel and was renowned for its unique approach to terrorist study. Among the great sages and leaders in Surah were Rav, Rav Huna, Rav Chista, Rav Vina, and Rav Ashi. The Babylonian Talmud was for the most part redacted in Surah. There was another city with the same name. In order to distinguish between them, the other city was called Surah on the Euphrates. So, so far what we have over here, so far in our story, is that the Ten Commandments had been nullified from the prayer service, according to all these opinions, because of the heretics. Amema Savar, Lemik Beinu bin Harda'a. Amemar held, he wanted, in other words, to establish it, to establish the Ten Commandment reading in Harda'a. Omale Rav Ashi, Rav Ashi said to him, Kvabitnum mitnetaro mesaminim. Already they nullified them, meaning 
to say the Ten Commandments on account of the grievance of the heretics. So we see again, in this particular town, the same thing occurred, and Amaymer decided, wouldn't it be appropriate to include the Ten Commandments within the davening? And Rashi said, no, it would not be appropriate because we don't want that it's going to be as a, an advantage to the heretics but rather, we take it out of the service altogether. If a person wants to recite it on his own after davening, let him recite it on his own after davening. But he shouldn't make it part of the service. It is not part of the service. It is not the most essential part of Torah. Let us not make a mistake. We need to know what is ikar, what is the main thing to do, and what is tafel, what is secondary to that, what is unnecessary sometimes. Naharda'a was a city on the Euphrates near the Malka River, Nahardai was one of the oldest Jewish communities in Babylonia. According to tradition, Jews lived in Nahardai as early as the first temple times, 6th century BCE. Beginning with the exile of King Jehoiachin of Judea, Nahardai was one of the most important Jewish communities in Babylonia. It was a center of Torah study from an early period, and its yeshiva was the oldest in Babylonia. Many of the greatest Tanaim, meaning those people responsible for the authorship of the Mishnah, visited Nahardai. Among them, Rabbi Akiva who intercalculated the calendar, it's an intercalated the calendar there, as it's brought down over there in Yevamot. In Rav's time, the first half of the third century CE, Naharda's yeshiva was headed by Rav Sheela and then by Shmuel. Since the city was located near the border between the Roman and the Persian empires, it frequently suffered from the wars between the two. Papa ben Nazir Odanatos, king of Tadmor, destroyed it completely in 259 CE. Later, however, Jews resettled there, and many tourist scholars remained in the Harda'a, even after its yeshiva moved to Mechoza and Pumpedita. Let us continue. Obe Shabbos. So we finished with that particular section about the Ten Commandments. We see clearly the ruling is we don't recite the Ten Commandments within the davening itself. Obe Shabbos, Moiseifin, Barachachas, Lemishma, Hayotzei. The Mishnah continued and said, on Shabbos, we add a blessing, one blessing to the outgoing watch, meaning the Kohanim who perform their duties in the temple. When they leave, we recite a special blessing for them. My brachachas, what is this blessing we recite? Omar Rabbi Chelbo, Rabbi Chelbo says, Mishmar Hayoitzer, Omer le Mishmar Nichnas. Comes out that the Mishmar, the guard, the watching, the service, people involved in the service who are leaving, say to the people who are coming in, Mi Sheshikain it Shmo Babai Sazer, the one who whose name has dwelt in this in this house, meaning the temple, who Yashkin Benechim, may he dwell amongst you, Ava with love, Vachva and brotherhood. The shalom and peace, the reos and camaraderie and friendship. That is the blessing that they would give. Something very fascinating when we learn the Gemara and all these different teachings. We see the tremendous love that was that existed between the Jewish people, between each other. That wherever there was a connection between each other, there were always words of beauty, words of love. These are things we need to learn for ourselves. Take it into our own hearts that when we're interacting with a fellow Jew, what we're seeking for this particular Jew is the good for him. We want it to be goodness for them. We want it to be goodness for ourselves. We want Hashem to bless us. We want Hashem to bless them equally. Because Hashem blesses me does not detract it all from the possibility that he can bless you too. Not only that, he is so infinite that even if he blesses me with uh, an, 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 a huge amount of wealth, he can bless you with even more wealth. And if he blesses me with good health, he can bless you with even better health. And this is, the, this is the infinity of God. And we need to be able to see that and be able to relate to it. That we lose out on nothing when we wish somebody else good. Now, the Gemara continues. Oh, one, one point here, the notes. May he cause love and brotherhood, peace and camaraderie to dwell among you. Some explain that the incoming priestly watch was blessed with this particular blessing because at least for a brief period, the choice of the priest who would perform particular service in the temple was based on the result of competition between the priests. This competition sometimes led to calamitous results. Therefore, this blessing was recited in the hope 
that the incoming watch would be blessed with brotherhood and peace, which is exactly what we just said over, over here, that we don't really lose out on anything. Hashem is infinite, and therefore it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. One person looks like he's got more than another person, but it doesn't matter because God is so infinite that he's able to bless another person with even more. We continue in the Gemara. Makom she'amrul arich, in a place where they said to lengthen, remember what we said in the Mishnah? We said that whenever the sages said, in relation to the version of the blessing, that when the sages said that the blessing should be long, we should not make it short. If the sages said that the blessing should be short, we do not make it long. The format of the blessing, the structure of the blessing, is exactly in accordance with the way that the rabbis want it to be, and that's how it should be. So, makom she'amrul harich, in a place where the sages said that one should lengthen out the blessing, the blessing must have many words to it. Pshita, says the Gemara, that's obvious. What does it mean it's obvious? This style is employed at times as an introduction to raising a well-formulated dilemma, as the parameters of the question must be established first. Therefore, the questioner or the Gemara explains what elements remain outside the parameters of the discussion in order to isolate the central problem and focus upon it. Which means to say, this is obvious. Makom shamul arif. If they said to lengthen, well, of course they mean to lengthen. Did you think they meant to make it shorter? Obviously. What is it referring to? Ha the nakit kasa the chamra bidei. The Gemara continues with another scenario. This is what happens. Where it occurred, where a person holding a cup of wine in his hand, the kasavar, the shikrahu, and he thought that it was beer. What's the problem here? A person's about to make a blessing on some liquids that he holds in his hand, in a cup. And he says to himself, I'm about to make a blessing on this beer. But unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it, he is holding wine. The blessing on wine is Borei Priya Gofin. The blessing on beer is She'akol Niyabit Varo. Now, if a person makes She'akol Niyabit Varo on wine, which is the general blessing that one can recite on anything, really one could even recite it on bread if one wanted to, not that one should. But just assume that a person was just learning the halachot of brachot, and he didn't know what to do with himself. He hasn't learned all the halachot, and he says immediately he wants to recite a blessing on the bread. He could even recite she'akol on the bread in front of him. Of course, we don't do this practically. It's easy enough to learn that the bracha is hamotzi lechem in the aretz, but let's assume a person did do it. He fulfilled his obligation, at least the diabad. A person's holding one. He's going to make she'akol on the one. Good for him. It's not the ideal blessing. But he still fulfilled his obligation. What about if he's holding in his hand one? What about if he's holding beer and he thinks it's one and he's going to make the blessing of one and it's actually beer? Well, not only didn't he fulfill his obligation because he recited Bore Priya Eights, uh, Bore Priya Goffin on the beer, which is incorrect, but he made a bracha levatala. He made a broch in vain. So the Gemara is discussing the issue. Where it happened, a person was holding a cup of wine in his hand, the kasab of the shikrahu, and he thought he was holding beer. If he thought he was holding beer, which broch is he going to make? Sheakol. Upetach, and he starts the brocha. Baruch atah Hashem, elokeinu melech haolam, umevarecha daeta de shikra. And he has in mind that he's going to be blessing on the beer. He's going to say, She'akol niya bidvaro. He's about to say it. But just before he says, She'akol niya bidvaro, he remembered, hey, this is not, this is not a beer. This is wine. The siyem v'dechamra. And he concludes it on the wine. So he goes, Baruch ata Hashem, Elokeinu melech haolam. He's thinking about the beer. He's thinking about the she'akol. He looks in front of him. Oi. It's one. So he concludes, Bore pri hagofin. Says the Gemara, Yatsa. He fulfilled his obligation. Well, why would I think that he didn't fulfill it? The e nami, because if, so, if also, 
Im Amar Shakol Niya Bidvaro, if he had made the blessing uh, from all things, uh, all things exist in accordance with God's will, Shakol Niya Bidvaro, Yatsa, he fulfilled his obligation. And therefore, what he had in mind of the Shakol fulfills obligation number one. And the fact that he made Borei Priyakothin for sure fulfills obligation number two. So, this is interesting. The heart to none, because we look, we learnt it says over there, Al Kulam on all things, Ima Mar Sheakol Niyabitvaro Yatsa. If a person makes the blessing of Sheakol Niyabitvaro, the lowest level blessing, he fulfills the obligation on everything. So far, so good. Let's take a look at this halakha, where one took a cup of beer in his hand. Oh, yeah, he took the, we're not there yet. Ella, however. What about the case of a person who took into his hand a cup of beer? The kasava de kamrahu. And he thinks to himself, he thought to himself that he was holding one. So he goes, Baruch ata Hashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam. And he's thinking to himself, he's going to end the bracha of Borei Priyakofin because he thinks he's holding the one. But actually he's holding the beer, which is Shehako. And he looks into the cup and he realizes all of a sudden that it's beer. He opens up and he blesses, having in mind on the one. And then he concluded with the beer, which means in his mind, he's thinking, He says God's name. Once you say God's name, already you must have in mind what you're saying God's name for. One should never recite a bracha. And then look around the room as if to say, well, what blessing should I recite now? Or, or, or worse, go and ask somebody at that moment in time, oh, is this Borei Priya 8? Is this Borei Priya Adama? In the chair, call, I don't know what to do here. Rather, when a person holds the atom in his hand, he already thinks the blessing that he's going to recite. And when he says God's name, he has in mind clearly what the blessing applies to. So is the halakha. So now this fellow, he made a bit of a mistake. What did he do? He was holding the beer in his hand. But when he said God's name as he was reciting the blessing, he had in mind to conclude the blessing with Borei Pri Hagathin on the one. But now he concluded it after all on the beer. He said Shako, which means in his mind, he contemplated Borei Pri Hagathin, but practically when he said the words, he said, Isn't the word itself sufficient? What do we care what he thought in his mind? The Gemara asks, My, what is the halakha? Take a look here at the halakha. Where one took a cup of beer in his hand, the case of one who mistakenly began to recite a blessing with the intention of reciting an incorrect blessing, as in the case of one who began to recite the blessing over wine on beer, is not resolved in the Gemara. Therefore, as per the rule in the other cases of uncertainty with regard to blessing, the halakha and common practice is to be lenient. Why? Because we have a concept that safek drabonan lehakel or safek brachas lehakel. When we are in doubt with regards to rabbinical enactments, rabbinical prescriptions, rabbinical laws, one of them being brachot, all the laws of brachot are rabbinical in nature. The only bracha, there are only two brachot, which are Torah related, and that is the bracha of benching after one eats uh, bread. That is a bracha which is for sure from the Torah. You shall eat and be satisfied and bless Hashem. That refers to the blessing after eating bread. And the second blessing, which we've just learned about in this Shi'ur and the previous lesson, is the blessing on the Torah. The, the blessing that we recite on learning Torah is actually a biblical blessing and must be recited. And therefore, if one is in doubt, did one recite it or not, one must recite it again. However, all the other blessings that we speak about, we follow the law to be lenient. Wherever there's a rabbinical prescription and we're not sure, did we do right or did we do wrong? We do not repeat it. We follow the lenient opinion and so is the halakha and so is it accepted. So see, we see over here that we're lenient and therefore he is not required to recite another blessing. 
Well, in any case, this particular fellow recited Shia call, and it certainly is the correct bracha when it came out of his mouth. Although in his head, he didn't have the correct bracha in mind, which in itself is a problem. And it's a question. He should have had the correct bracha in mind. There are divergent opinions among the decisors of halakha. However, as the Ga'inim had in their possession a variant reading of the Gemara, leading them to a different conclusion and a different ruling. So that is basically concluding that section of what happened over here. And because we're in doubt about the whole story, we don't know what to say about it. And therefore, we follow the lenient opinion. So the Gemara asks the question and says, Batar ikar bracha azlinan? Do we follow after the beginning? Of the bracha, Baruch Ata Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam. I'm thinking about one, but there's beer. Do we follow the beginning? Or Bata Chatima Azlina? Or is it after the conclusion that we go? Which means, but he recited Shea Kol. Who cares what goes on in his head? Do we follow the beginning of the blessing? Or do we follow the end of the blessing? So now we finish the section where we were discussing the blessing that was recited on the wine, on the beer, and we see that the Gemara did not come to a conclusion. At this point in time, the Gemara is now going to go to our next section, as we see that there was no answer to it. So the Gemara goes to the next section immediately, and we just follow the lenient opinion, so is the Halakha. Thanks for joining me. We've reached the end of the Shi'ur. We've ended at a good place. So let's conclude this year. Thanks for joining me. I'm Eliyahu Sher from Chesed Ve'emet, broadcasting from the holy city of Yerushalayim. You can find my site on www.lovingkindness.co. And I ask you, please, if you've enjoyed this shiur and got something out of it from the beginning of the shiur, the end of the shiur, it doesn't make a difference. Please like my video. Please make a positive comment and share my video with friends and family. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. And, and also to click on the bell button to be notified of future shiurim. Don't forget, this is a, an interactive class. And even if we're not interacting over here, please interact on the YouTube channel. Let me know your thoughts and comments. Tell me what you love about blessing on the Torah. Tell me what you love about studying the Torah. Do you love studying Torah? What are you getting out of it? What, what motivates you? What are you enjoying about it? Do you make blessings on food? What does that do to you? Is it important to? What do you get out of it? What have you learned from the Shi'ur? Share something in the Shi'ur and let's all grow together. I'm happy to comment back, send in your questions, or of course, if you're shy and you don't want to send a question onto the YouTube, please send a question directly through my website and I would still be happy to answer you and, and get involved in a discussion. If you'd like to learn more Torah, please send me an email. You can join us live as we're doing over here with other people in the Shi'ur. And, uh, uh, and of course, uh, if you want to learn one-on-one -on -one with me privately, there are a number of areas that I'm involved in teaching. Come and see what I'm involved in and join me for a Shi'ur of your choice in a book of your choice. Thanks so much for joining me. I wish you everything of the best and I look forward to another Shi'ur in the near future. Take care. Shalom, shalom. Bye-bye.